Hello, I'm Megan DeBroat, standing in for Harley Schlanger. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's dialogue with Helga Zepp LaRouche, founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. Today is July 29th, 2021. So I think we have a lot to discuss today, Helga, on the strategic front, on the economic front, which as we've been urging to our viewers are really one and the same crisis. So why don't we start with the escalating offensive to push the idea of man-made climate change, which has only risen to complete hysteria following the very um, devastating flooding events in Germany of the recent weeks. We also have the upcoming COP26 uh, climate summit in Glasgow, which is planned for this November. So Helga, maybe you can update us on okay. what's happening on this front. Well, as we <clears throat> said many times, the uh, man-made climate change is a hoax. And what is really behind it is that the financial system of the transatlantic sector is completely bankrupt and about to go into a hyperinflationary blowout. So the central banks, you know, headed by Mark Carney, former head of the Bank of England, and other central bankers, they are trying to shift the trillions, as they said it, by keeping the bubble going, you know, just another round by going essentially into the same policy like Yalmach Schacht uh, did it, uh, you know, 80 years ago, by basically trying to get a complete control of the central banks over the entire money issuing by you know preventing banks from uh, giving credit for real production by shifting the trillion into a new bubble uh, namely you know green technology alternative energy resources going out of uh, nuclear going out of uh, fossil fuels which you know now the ipcc is uh, supposed to come out with their final preparatory report for the Glasgow COP26 meeting on August 9th. And what is said ahead of time is that the, uh, you know, report will, you know, cause complete alarm. This was echoed by another statement by the so-called 11,000 scientists who say that drastic cuts have to occur in human activity uh, because the climate change is so dramatic. And as they also admit for the first time, this is supposed to, you know, lead to a declining population. Now, that's what we have been saying the whole time. The real aim of this is that the Malthusians, uh, which happen to sit in the city of London, in, in the Wall Street, uh, they want to cut the population. They want to go for a massive population reduction. And, you know, this is the danger of a new fascism and people should not be confused about that because, you know, it's not true that there is a consensus among scientists that the climate change is due to anthropogenic causes. Uh, there has been climate change always. You always go from uh, ice ages to warm weather periods. This is going on for millions of years, but this present scare is designed to impose really a global fascist dictatorship of the central banks and it is it is fascism and you know if this is not opposed you know it will lead to social chaos because you know all these policies will lead to a dramatic price increase in energy in food production it will collapse the real economy it can only lead to a complete catastrophe and, you know, then naturally uh, the weak ones, the poor people of the world, of the developing countries, they will be the victims. You already see right now the schemes which are being made. You know, like, for example, Mark Carney, who, who said, you know, there has to be a, a, a deal between the developing countries whereby they get money directly uh, for making an agreement that they will not develop. This is completely, I mean, if you look at the world right now, we are in the middle of a pandemic. We are in a world famine of biblical dimension, as uh, Beasley from the World Food Program 
keep stressing. And then these people want to cut human activity, which in the consequence would mean no development in the developing countries, cutting back you know, the living standard dramatically in the so-called advanced sector. And uh, people have to wake up, you know, the fact that we had a flood in Germany uh, was due not to climate change. This is a complete lie. This was due to the fact that existing programs of infrastructure investments were not done because Schäuble wants to insist on his black zero balanced budget. And, you know, in, in one of these rivers which were flooded, you know, the Greenies uh, managed to remove certain uh, dams uh, by, in order to allow the fish to swim more easily up and down the river. But the result of it was there was no way to, to regulate this uh, enormous uh, rainfall. So the green policy and the black zero policy, the non-investment in infrastructure was uh, responsible for this flood, flood. So I can only warn people, that this is not settled at all. Uh, this is a, a gigantic fraud, which is supposed to be imposed on the population. And Helga, it, it seems like not every nation is willing to go along with this, at least not completely. For example, Egypt recently has made major moves toward nuclear energy and building up their nuclear sector. They've brought in Russia's Rosatom to help them build nuclear reactors. Also, um, just a few days ago, the president of Bolivia inaugurated the construction of a new nuclear research reactor in El Alto. Um, and then along the same lines, the nations of South America and, and Central America just came together to create the Latin American Space Agency, and I thought this was interesting. The, the president of Paraguay, Ace, uh, Acevedo, at that ceremony said, we may not yet have satellites to place in orbit, but we are beginning to place into orbit those enemies of success, those apostles of failure, the mediocre and the resentful. And um, over the weekend, this last weekend, July 24th, you initiated a Schiller Institute conference, which I think was very successful, exactly on this issue to intervene on the lies and the fraud of this Malthusian climate change hoax. Maybe you could tell our viewers a little bit about that conference. Well, what we are actually doing uh, since a while, and that conference on Saturday was uh, just one more important step, we are building an international anti-Malthusian alliance because all of these schemes are really nothing else than modern version of, uh, you know, what Malthus had said. And, you know, this he was just an agent for the British East India Company trying to, you know, uh, develop a so-called theory for their practices of colonialism uh, in, in, you know, India and, and other places. So what we are doing is we have now uh, scientists from Africa, South Africa, other African nations, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, France, Holland, the United States, and we are in contact with similar scientists in Russia and other Asian countries. And they all basically have extensive models and research and, and uh, data uh, <clears throat> analysis, which absolutely put into question what is being put out by the IPCC. So, you know, I can only suggest to you, our viewers, uh, go to the Schiller Institute, watch this uh, panels from last Saturday and get it around because it's not true. I mean, one of the lies which are being uh, peddled is that there is a consensus among the scientists. Far from it. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, each of the scientists who spoke last Saturday is not just an individual, but they represent groups of such people in the respective countries. You know, they put out a letter on their own saying there is no climate uh, emergency. They sent this letter to the EU Commission, to the General Secretary of the United Nations, to all governments. And I think that there, what is needed, the minimum what is needed is an honest debate. You know, what are the causes for climate change? And, you know, some of the uh, speakers uh, on Saturday, you know, actually said that there may be uh, positive effects of climate change, that you have warming periods where food and other, uh, you know, 
<clears throat> other things from nature grow much better. Uh, so it, it's not a settled question at all. Good. I think that's very important. Um, I was speaking to one such scientist as you were describing, who, who, who's not going along with this lie the other day, and he said that at first his group thought that they could just convince people with reason, but now he realizes that it's a much bigger political fight. So I just bring that up to underscore what you're saying about bringing together a worldwide anti-Malthusian alliance to really leverage this across the entire world. Um, why don't we, though, why don't we turn our discussion for now to the strategic war danger? Uh, representatives of the United States and Russia just concluded a series of meetings in Geneva, talks on strategic arm control. And this is a follow-up to uh, President Putin and President Biden's meeting in Geneva of last month. The Russian Deputy Foreign Minister, Sergei Ryabkov, who was at the meeting, he said afterwards that the discussions were very down-to-earth, very business-like, very focused, conscious, and rational. But Helga, what's your assessment of this situation? Are things headed in the right direction? Well, I think any a reasonable person on the planet would hope that that is the case. You know, and I think it's a baby step, tiny baby step in the right direction that these uh, strategic stability talks are taking place in Geneva. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, that's not the whole picture um, because uh, President Biden uh, almost at the same time made a meeting in the offices of the National Director of Intelligence, uh, Avril Haynes, a meeting with uh, many representatives of the intelligence community where he um, you know, said, yes, we have to cooperate, meaning the United States, uh, with Russia and China. Um, there are areas where such cooperation is, is necessary. But he said uh, that these countries could become mortal um, competitors uh, down the road. And, you know, then he proceeded to say that, you know, if it ever would come to a shooting war with one of these major nuclear powers, uh, then it would be triggered by a major cyber breach. You know, naturally, that is almost an invitation for third forces to set up a cyber attack, which then can be blamed on either Russia or China. Um, and alone that, you know, to, to say a shooting war with one of these nations, uh, you know. But then he said, you know, that he met Putin and, you know, Putin has big problems because he uh, has an economy which is in big trouble, which only has nuclear weapons and oil wells and nothing else. And he repeated nothing else. And that would make him all the more dangerous. Now, this is, again, the same a derogatory speech like we knew it from Obama, who said Russia is only a, a regional power, um, you know, and that was the reason why then uh, President Putin and, and the Russian government proceeded to develop some new, um, you know, qualitatively new hypersonic uh, and other weapons, which undid, at least for the time being, the entire global a nuclear defense system of the United States. Now, now that's the kind of arms race, you know, which first of all is is, is a complete, I mean, it, it's a question of self-defense, but from the standpoint of the productive capacity of the earth, any kind of arms race in a world which is so, you know, in, in such a dire condition is just a waste, a complete waste. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, the United States are now trying to, to catch up. Um, but, you know, it is that kind of talk which is poisoning the atmosphere. And, you know, it's very dangerous because how can you build up trust? There is already a complete loss of trust among, you know, the so-called West and, and Russia and China uh, and all their respective uh, partners and allies. Um, how can you have any kind of strategic stability, you know, when on the one side, you know, you say, let's have a rational discussion, but at the same time, um, you know, there are many, many 
geopolitical destabilizations, like Biden also met the opposition leader of Belarus, uh, Tikhanuskaya. I'm probably pronouncing it not correctly. <clears throat> she also met with uh, Victoria Nuland and Blinken and Sullivan. Uh, and you start to wonder, you know, is there another regime change operation against Belarus in place? I mean, that's what Victoria Nuland uh, did in, in Ukraine. Then, you know, you have Blinken uh, running around presently in India, uh, clearly trying to, you know, develop a special relationship between the United States and India in an anti-China, anti-Russian uh, position. And this is all very, very fragile. I mean, I, I think if people would know how fragile world peace is, they would not sleep. And that would be better than sleepwalking into World War Three. Well, I'm glad you brought up China, uh, China, Helga, because the situation with China is not much better. One maybe could claim even worse. The U.S. Defense Secretary Austin either just concluded or maybe he's still on a tour in Southeast Asia where he's visiting many nations, uh, making big speeches about pulling these nations together into an alliance to defend their rights in the region, which is obviously aimed at China. Um, so can you tell us more about what's going on in this situation? Well, it's a kind of brinkmanship, which, which you know, I think that's probably the most very, very some um, theater, you know, the South uh, South China Sea, um, the situation around Taiwan, um, where I can only say that in the Chinese American community in the United States in particular, but also in Europe, there is a huge worry uh, among uh, overseas Chinese who see the bellicose tone who think that maybe a war between the United States and China is uh, inevitable in the short term, and they are scared. Uh, in, there was also all this anti-Chinese citizen, anti-Chinese student, anti-Chinese uh, uh, scientist uh, moves in the last month, you know, going back to what happened during the Trump administration already. And, you know, people are really scared because, you know, it is very clear that, you know, if the uh, independence uh, faction in Taiwan would get signals that they should go for independence, this is one of the red lines which mainland China will not accept. If it would come to some military confrontation, it's generally expected that the Chinese will, will win very clearly because if you look where, where Taiwan is and, you know, what is the power of the Chinese there. And then the question is, would it come to the use of nuclear weapon? And, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that, you know, the arguments of people like Ted Postol and, and Christensen and other experts on nuclear weapons uh, is absolutely true that once you use one nuclear weapon, the entire arsenal will be used for re reasons which have to do with the logic of the difference between a conventional and a nuclear war. Now, that would be the end of civilization. And, you know, I think the idea to contain China, uh, to prevent the rise of China, uh, it's not feasible. I mean, it's not feasible unless you use nuclear weapons and you destroy the entire human species because, you know, China was one of the leading nations or the leading nations actually for centuries until about the 17th century. And now they are basically undoing what was done to them in the century of humiliation by British uh, imperialism, by the opium wars, by the very difficult 20th century. And China is conducting an economic policy which is obviously doing a lot of things absolutely right, which is why China lifted 850 million people out of poverty, why they are now uh, in a position to help other developing countries to go in the same direction. And, you know, this is a good thing. China has committed a tremendous civilizational contribution by doing that. I mean, where would the world be in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of a famine, 
if China's economy would still be in the condition like it was 40 years ago. There would be almost no hope to, to get the kind of engine to pull the world out of the depression. So the idea to contain China is, is wrong. I know that many of our viewers have been absolutely influenced by a media campaign portraying China as a monster. But you know, it, it, China is not a monster. I think the uh, success of the Chinese model of economy is something many countries should learn from. Uh, and you know, we have discussed this in the past. You know, in many ways, what the Chinese economic model uh, has accomplished is very much like the early American system of economy of Alexander Hamilton. It's just a much more dirigistic approach. But that used to be the approach of the Western economies. That used to be the German economic miracle, which you know helped to reconstruct Germany after the Second World War, had the same kind of sort of dirigistic uh, uh, orientation what, what China now has. So there are a lot of myths, but I think you know the idea um, that um, China is the enemy is is a completely false idea, and the Chinese government has said many times you, that it it has no basis in reality to construct China and Russia as such enemy images because their policies are not uh, doing what they are being accused of, and if there would be a willingness by the West to cooperate, all these dangers could vanish practically overnight. Well, Helga, speaking of cooperation, I want to turn to the question of Afghanistan. Now, you issued a statement earlier this month following the U.S. troop withdrawal from Afghanistan that it was absolutely urgent that the neighbors of Afghanistan, including powers such as China and Russia, come together with agreements with Afghanistan to rebuild Afghanistan into an economically modern Renaissance nation, and that crucially, the United States had to be brought in to this cooperation for the good. Now, along these lines, we've also just had the visit of Taliban leaders to China to meet with Wang Yi, and there was a very important meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Tajikistan, which took up this issue of the future of Afghanistan. So could you say more on this? What's your perspective on this? Well, I I said that the Afghanistan situation for a very short period of time represents one of these unique moments where you can change the direction of policy. I mean, I, I even compared it to the fall of the wall in 1989, where for a very short period of time with the German unification following and, you know, there was a potential to establish a peace order because communism had just vanished. That chance was was missed, um, you know, for geopolitical reasons that, you know, this is a whole other subject, but there was a short moment of maybe several months, a potential that, you know, it could have led to the Eurasian land bridge. What we see with the new Silk Road today, we, we suggested that. Uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and it, it would have totally changed the history uh, of the world if that would have been, um, you know, accepted. Now we have a situation with Afghanistan where NATO troops are being pulled out, and now the question is: Will this lead to a continuation of the war in the form of a civil war? Uh, the, the Taliban and ISIS, Al Qaeda, the government forces, all you know, continuing the war with terrible results, growth of terrorism, growth of opium production, and throwing the whole region and beyond into chaos. That is a danger. Or can it be a situation where a peaceful solution can be found, where all the parties of Afghanistan somehow, you know, settle their own affairs. The Afghanis are very proud people who, who really do not want foreign powers to meddle in their internal affairs. They had enough of that. And can the region 
as a whole, all the neighbor states, the Central Asian republics, you know, Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, India, all these people have an interest that this region uh, develops peacefully. And I think, you know, that there is a tendency to recognize, you know, this has been both expressed by the existing Afghani government, that they would appreciate the collaboration with China and the Belt and Road Initiative, but also the fact that the Taliban leader, Barada, was just in China meeting with Wang Yi, as you just mentioned, you know, and he expressed that the Taliban is not intending to do anything which would be against the interest of China. And on the other side, you know, Wang Yi uh, said that China is absolutely committed to the territorial integrity of Afghanistan, non-interference in the internal affairs. Um, and as you said, the SCO meeting, Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, and uh, also some other meetings which took place in the last week, uh, clearly show a potential that if one would extend the China-Pakistan economic corridor into Kabul, into Central Asia, you could start to build the kind of infrastructure which would sort of complete the Eurasian connectivity, as some countries would call it, or Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, in any case, you would bring in infrastructure, agriculture, industry into the whole region in an integrated way. That way, you know, you would establish a health system in Afghanistan, which is practically non-existent. Uh, you would develop agriculture instead of opium production. You would increase the life uh, living standard, the life expectancy, and it would just be beneficial for the Afghani people and all the neighbors. So what we want to do is uh, we have on this coming Saturday a seminar with important speakers from the region. Um, and we want to propose exactly this approach. And hopefully, you know, it will come to a cooperation between the United States, Russia and China. Um, which you know the Afghani ambassador to China said recently that Afghanistan is the one place where the United States and China could cooperate. And hopefully, you know, once you start to cooperate in a meaningful, in a very serious fashion, someplace, this could become the model of you know really changing the relationship on the strategic level, which I described earlier. Um, you know, as a step in the right direction of a peace approach uh, more at large. So I think from the standpoint of world history um, and, and humanity as a whole, uh, this, the world stage is right now in Afghanistan. And, you know, a lot depends if this historic moment is being used for the better. Well, Helga, I think that's extremely important, especially considering the assault that's taken place against citizens of the United States and, and Europe and so forth over the past decades, which has really degenerated the culture into one of ugliness, violence, war. And I think if people really concentrate on what you just went through and allow their imaginations to be filled with a vision of um, what perhaps is one of the most destroyed parts of the planet, very quickly turning into one of the most beautiful and flourishing parts of the planet, I think that that, you know, that really does um, provide the basis for people to start to understand what you're bringing up about this historic opportunity. Um, now, just um, moving toward our conclusion, I wanted to, you mentioned the conference that we're holding this weekend, which will be July 31st, this Saturday, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central European time. Um, is there anything else you want to say about that conference or anything else you'd like to tell our viewers before we go? Well, I think the uh, 14th uh, of August conference will be a milestone because it will commemorate a prophetic um, statement by my late husband, Lyndon LaRouge, 
who was probably the only economist who absolutely recognized the significance of what Nixon did on the 15th of August 71, when he destroyed the Bretton Woods system by replacing the fixed exchange rate with floating exchange rates. Uh, and then at that time, my husband said, you know, if this tendency towards monetarism is continued, it will lead to the danger of a new fascism, a danger of a new war and a depression, or we will go for a completely different system. Now that was absolutely on the mark. And we are now at that point, we are looking at the danger of a new fascism in the form of Yalmach Schachtian economics, which is what is behind this Green Deal. And we are looking at the danger of war. And naturally, we are in a depression, um, you know, but for certain bubbles, uh, one absolutely can can say that. So, you know, we will review this. We will also review the remedies which were uh, presented by Lyndon LaRouche. And we will have a extraordinary number of uh, speakers who knew my husband or who have studied in depth his works. And that is what we want to catalyze because the solutions of Linda LaRouche are still the absolute best way we can get out of this crisis there is. So you should prepare, you know, to be, reserve the date, register, participate in the discussion and uh, get the news about this conference around as wide as you can. And, um, Otherwise, you know, uh, in, in conclusion, I just want to say, you know, many people are so distraught about politics. They are pessimistic. They, they don't see any positive vision for the future. And that leads to pessim cultural pessimism leads to fascism. I mean, that's what it did in the 30s. And that's the danger now. So I think, you know, if people would just listen to us that we need a change in the paradigm. We have to return politics to be a force for the good in the world. It's not a law of the universe that politics is dirty and that politicians are corrupt. I mean, there have been periods where politics was a fountain of the good, like Solon of Athens, for example. Uh, Louis Ons in France. Uh, I could probably come up with a whole bunch of other examples where mankind progressed and right now i think we are called upon you know do we have the moral fiber in us to survive as a human species and you know as you mentioned there are so many people who have aspirations to you know go back to the best traditions of the great cultures there was a beautiful speech i think it was the president of uzbekistan recently uh, who called upon all the great thinkers of, of the history of that region uh, to be activated. And the idea, you know, that, that developing countries want to be spacefaring powers is fantastic. They want to leapfrog under development and become, you know, part of the spacefaring community and enter a new chapter in the history of, of civilization. So join us and let us try to make you know, politics force for good. I absolutely think it's possible. Okay. So people should go to the schillerinstitute.com to register for this Saturday's conference on Afghanistan. There they can find information about the conference on August 14th, which is sponsored by the LaRouche Legacy Foundation. You should subscribe so that you don't miss any of our updates and become a member of the Schiller Institute to join in exactly as Helga has just called upon you to. So Helga, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful discussion and we look forward to next week. Thank you. See you Till soon. Till next week.